afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Ken said my name is Alan Galley. I'm the Inspiration <coughs> Director for the Canada Mining Innovation Council. And I work closely with uh, Francois Robert, who is the uh, Chief Geologist at the Exploration for Fair to um, develop a, uh, a better tool, a better instrument that allows the Canadian mining industry to have um, a single voice with respect to what they require with respect to research, development, and innovation in Canada. And uh, this uh, organization started about 2007. And, uh, and uh, Francois uh, Robert was hoping to be here today uh, to, to give a, uh, an overview of what industry expectations are with respect to, to uh, deep exploration and undercover. Unfortunately, he has a, a meeting at, the, at his office today. So uh, I'm sort of basically said that CMIC, which is uh, the CMIC Exploration Group, which is 35 companies, a half of which are service providers, the other half are exploration and mining companies, he felt that that was fairly representative of, of, of what um, the Canadian mineral industry would like to see how we move forward with respect to um, being able to, to explore more effectively. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about today um, is this idea of who drives, uh, who drives the changes in the industry, who should be driving the changes. Um, we talked about how the companies that CMA Exploration got together and decided that before uh, we could decide how to develop that change, we have a little bit of it. So we'll briefly take you through that roadmap of where to look, how to look, data to knowledge, and you know, more importantly, and probably the most important thing is how to use these vast amounts of all knowledge that, that all of our companies are, are, are developing all the time. To move on to that is this idea that we can no longer treat exploration in isolation from the rest of the life of mine continuum. Is that more and more the important things that are done in advanced exploration are key to more effective mine design, more effective processing, um, and, and basically uh, minimizing the footprint of mining by, by being more effective in the advanced stages. And I think that this is an important thing to keep in mind as we're moving forward uh, in this new decade. Um, and this idea again of the mechanisms of the uh, that require genes that I think we need in the industry. Um, some of the points I'll be making again, this idea that service providers drive the advances. And the reason why is because these guys have to innovate every day to stay in business. And so to them, innovation isn't something that's some kind of a paradigm shift. It's the way they have to do business to survive. So that's why in the CIMIC structure, we have a lot of service providers because they're there to talk one-on-one -on -one with the mineral industry people during our various meetings, and then they can take those 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 uh, uh, challenges away that the mining industry sees, and they can they can directly start to, to, to translate that into some commercial product product that then comes to the market, and obviously if the market's happy with it, then it, it buys it, and it's win-win for everyone. So I think we got to. The idea is, to, is there has to be mechanisms, and, and CIMIC is one of those, and there's other ones in, in Amira, uh, in Australia, for example, that the mineral industry keeps service providers aware of market requirements. And I think that it's uh, you can do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or you can join consortia, uh, as I said, like Amira or like CIMIC or like Amira, that allows you to have this, this more of a, a collective voice uh, and a consensus with regards to directions and new technologies, uh, et cetera. And I think that this uh, this idea that it's not the technologies that we really need. I think that's what's happened is that the technology is changing so quickly that it, it, it's just hard for us to keep up with what our company requires uh, with respect to, to real-time analysis, with respect to decision-making tools that are becoming more important. So this idea of developing, rather than focusing on the new technology, should be it's really how you should be using those new technologies. And this is what, again, during our annual CIMIC meeting at, uh, at the Vancouver Roundup, this is what came out of it, is that everybody was saying, yeah, yeah, Gally, you know, real-time, near real-time, this is all great, but how do we use all this? Yeah, yeah. What's the multi-instrument platform and protocols that we can use for our particular type of exploration program to make us more effective? Um, so, again, this idea of not being able to do it alone, I think there's the Rio Tintos of the world and, and the BHP Bellatons and, and perhaps others that have strong internal RDI uh, communities, but more and more, and, and including Rio Tinto, they're realizing that 
Working in isolation is not a healthy way to advance uh, your, your company's um, requirements for RDI. And so this idea of, of, of working in, in consortia, that uh, just for the pure economics, a lot of companies have gotten rid of their, their research and, and development capacity. And so more and more, they have to find ways to mitigate that investment risk in RDI. And doing that is you getting together with other companies, again, in these various formats. Uh, that are usually non-profit organizations that are developed to, to, to help uh, industry move forward uh, in a, as a pre-competitive collective. Uh, and so again, this is an important part of this idea of advancing uh, how we can do exploration. Uh, and, and what it is, it's just saying, and whether we like it or not, uh, we're, we're a fairly conservative uh, sector. And what I found in my four years with CNIC that Everybody strives to be second because nobody wants to invest first and take the risk. Um, so again, by, oh, by taking a consortia approach, oh, you, you don't have to worry about waiting for somebody else to take a risk because you mitigate the risk through that consortia development. Um, okay, keeping, I think we, these books and pull backwards or forwards here, sorry. It would be easy. So for CMIC, one of the first things that these 30-odd um, companies did Again, to, to say that it, it's all very well to focus on avenues that we want to advance technologies and, and knowledge, but it has to be put into a big picture. And, and I, this is quite appropriate because this is all about a decade of mineral exploration uh, advances. And for CMIC, we developed a 10 year roadmap, and this was developed in 2012. Um, and it was a basically, it all looks very simple, and it's nothing new and, 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 and radical that you all haven't thought about. It's a matter of putting it all together and deciding on the time frames that are reasonable for an organization or for your company to achieve uh, what you're trying to do. So this whole idea of discovery criteria, technologies, and data to knowledge, pretty simple. Where are we going to look, and, and what are we looking for? And we'll talk a bit about scales and stuff in that. Uh, and, and Mike will be talking a bit about this later. Um, this idea is that, well, we know what we're looking for, how, how can we detect it better? Uh, mapping the detection tools and cheaper drilling. This is something that uh, people will be talking about after me, about especially particularly this idea of looking under cover and, and blind targeting and deep targeting. And probably the most important is this idea of data to knowledge. That, um, yeah, I think it was John Thompson that said that we're all data rich and, and knowledge poor. Um, Newmont told me that their, their, their database was larger than the Congressional Library, but they had no idea what was in it. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is serious stuff. You're spending a lot of money collecting this data. You should be able to use it properly. There's all this idea of, of better visualization and integration, and, and some more specific things about how you can better integrate uh, your data to make it more effective. So, you can, again, it's broken down. There's no surprises here for, for all of you. You know, we're looking in deep and sure camps and remote and covered areas. And these aren't siloed. Obviously, what you're looking at in, in brown fields, deep, deep environments are going to have the same kind of tools. They're going to overlap in what you're doing and you're looking in, in remote and covered. And remote and covered is, is a big challenge for particularly uh, for Australia and Canada and obviously other places in the world. But sort of these two countries that are, are, are trying to drive the innovation agenda and exploration that obviously are recovered. It's a theme here that is a major concern. So what's important about this is that every time in, in when we get the CMIT folks together, the explorationists, and they say, well, we should be doing this, or we should be doing that, then you can go back and you can say, yeah, you're right. That's That was our number one priority. That happens to be our largest project to date, which is Footprints. Five years, $13 million, 30 companies involved in that. Um, we're working on something that's an exploration simulator as, as part of this. We're looking at real time and we're not looking at downhole because the uh, uh, deep exploration technology CRC in Australia is, has really got a, a good handle on that. Um, there are uh, requirements that may be particular to Canada uh, uh, with respect to, to covered trains that may be a little different than, uh, than the Australian model. And so there is some wiggle room that, that we can work in there. So again, the idea is that, and this is what Francois does, is that every time somebody comes up with a new idea, this thing gets thrown up on the board and they go, yeah, you're right, this is, this is where we're going and this is where it fits in. And, and about every two or three years, we revisit this roadmap to make sure that there isn't any huge changes in direction or paradigm shifts that, that we should be concentrating on. 
So when we're looking at discovery criteria, then there's still some major, uh, some major um, challenges that we're looking at. This idea of a better metallogenic context at the domain scale. And this is something that um, I think uh, the, the uh, folks in Western Australia uh, sort of, when they talk about mineral systems, and Cam, Cam will talk about this, is that this really is crustal scale, or, or let's say lithospheric scale, uh, a look at, at things. And so it, it really does, um, it's that whole idea of where to look uh, before the how to look. And I think we still haven't, we still haven't got a good handle on this. And if we can understand the processes better that form large deposits at the domain scale, that obviously it's going to make a huge difference in, in, in our global exploration programs and where we're going to go. This idea of better fertility indicators at the domain and or system environments. Um, that's the first question I often get asked if I'm going to a helicopter and they land on an intrusive complex, am I in the right place or not? And that's still a question that's being asked. So obviously that's still that's still an area that we have to do some work in. And then the definition of ore system footprints themselves, particularly in the context of using multi parameter data sets. Um, this idea of refining the, the footprint uh, of, of the ore system in, in, in physical and, and chemical space uh, is still something that's a challenge for, for exploration. So who should be doing this stuff? When we're looking at the main scale mapping, uh, potential <coughs> fertility studies, etc., this is perfect for provincial or state and federal surveys because they're the ones that have the money. They have a unique niche with respect to uh, mapping capabilities, both as uh, in geophysical, uh, geochemical, and, and, and geological mapping, uh, that they can take on these domain scale uh, sort of problems. And, and, uh, and uh, they're the ones that can take the risk, basically, to do this. And, and it really is the mandate. In some cases, I think um, province, states, and federal surveys, they lose their way every once in a while with respect to this mandate. And they, they, they really have to understand that, that there's a niche they fill, and nobody else can fill that niche. And they have to keep their eye on the ball and, and for the benefit of the, of, of the, minerals, uh, the minerals community. When it comes down to mineral system studies, the survey still can play a role in that. But we're now down to what we call mineral institutes. So these are the uh, mineral institutes uh, across Australia and in Canada that are usually focused on universities. Um, and uh, and they, they're, they're networks of, of expertise that can take on relatively large scale problems. But again, I think the Australians put it well that they really are focusing on that aspect of the mineral system and how you can identify it and how you understand those processes. And then we get down to the, to the actual ore deposit environments that, that where we have uh, lots of expertise in universities and in the mineral institutes. Uh, and in Canada, we're talking about NDRU and Merck and, and uh, uh, Consulv M in, in, uh, in Quebec. And I think the big challenge here is that this idea of linkages. And um, in, in some cases, it, it kind of comes in and out of focus, is that every one of these um, agencies has to understand their place in the system in order for all the gaps to be filled. Uh, and I think that that's still a challenge, particularly with the governments. Um, and of course, the big challenge with that, with the mineral institutes, is finding the money to do it, particularly in such a cyclical um, uh, market as, as, as uh, we see in exploration. So for discovery technologies, the things that have been discussed is this idea of more and more we're seeing automated remote sensing platforms for, for green seals and uh, the whole life of mine uh, monitoring, so for both detection and, and monitoring. This is, um, again, this is where technology is just advancing at a very rapid rate. Every time I pick up the paper, I see where we're going from something that can, can barely hold up a mag unit to, to something that they're, you're doing uh, uh, multi-parameter uh, geophysical surveys using uh, helicopter drones now. The big challenge in Canada with respect to green fields to this isn't the technology, it's the permitting. It's this idea of detect and evade that um, if you want to do a, a mag survey in the north of Canada right now, that's not allowed by the Department of Transport because your drone has to be able to detect any other objects in the air and evade them. Well, that's not great when you're trying to do a survey that's going back and forth on a bunch of lines, and you have to re-level your, your survey every time. So th there's and, and, and there's companies like uh, CDG that uh, have done a lot of work in this, and they're, they're getting around that problem with respect to the permitting uh, so that they're actually using it in marine surveys now uh, fairly effectively. But I think we'll see, probably within the next, I'd say, four to five years, that we'll start seeing a fairly consistent use of drones by the service industry to, to pick up information. 
Now, for those that were at uh, Sean Ryan's talk uh, yesterday, um, we see that you can already do this with the smaller drones at the property scale, where, where the permitting isn't, it isn't an issue. And uh, again, there's some, some fairly spectacular results being able to do that with respect to developing your own DEM and, uh, and hyperspectral uh, capacities. Looking deeper with greater certainty at lower cost, stripping away the, I'm going to go through these in other slides, stripping away the geophysical signatures of superficial cover. So in the case, and, and Michael talked about this on our uranium project at Footprints, uh, that is a, a major part of that, is how do you actually strip the cover off so the geophysics can look through that and actually look at the bedrock rather than be fooled by glacial, uh, the, 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 the composition of the glacial debris, particularly with respect to IP and EM surveys, when this can be a huge problem. And this idea, again, for undercover, the multi-parameter quantification of your secondary ore system footprint. Uh, and again, this is, this is something that uh, is still a huge challenge and a very complex challenge. So again, um, when we think of, of these instruments uh, on the high-tech side, you've got the Mars rover. Uh, but already, uh, we've got companies on Earth here that have taken these technologies, including uh, laser-induced uh, uh, ablation systems and all these other fancy things, and they're starting to apply them to, to Earth-based uh, terra-based systems. <coughs> Uh, University of Toronto, uh, they work closely with NASA, but the idea is to develop these things uh, also for the exploration industry. But again, this is where the entrepreneurship comes in, because you can do it through the university, you can do it through NASA, or you can do it through Sean Ryan's group in the UConn, that isn't waiting around for these big institutions to come up with the ideas, they're doing it themselves. And I think, again, it's important that the mineral industry supports this entrepreneurial spirit with respect to innovation in the industry. And it's these, these guys that are really pushing the agenda forward. So when it comes down to cover, you've seen this map of Australia quite a few times. It's been, I think it's actually refined the last time I saw it. This is 2010 Geoscience Australia. I developed a similar one for Canada. This idea that um, about 90% of both of our land masses are, are covered with uh, various thicknesses of superficial cover, various compositions and origin, uh, and all the major discoveries uh, to date, uh, with the exception of things like the Ring of Fire, perhaps, um, are made on, on relatively exposed shield and, and fan resolved rocks. And so there's a lot of potential out there, and obviously that this is what this, uh, this workshop is about, is how can we move forward to move off of those, uh, uh, those uh, outcrop rich terrains and into areas that uh, still have a lot of potential. So when we're looking at, at superficial cover, there's all sorts of really interesting things that are coming on now. And uh, the one that, a, a big focus at, uh, at MDRU and uh, at UBC is secondary dispersion of indicator minerals. So this idea is that if you can understand the, the, uh, the mineral finger footprint of your, of your primary uh, ore system, uh, then the idea is that how to follow that into the into that uh, cover machine, and what happens to the mineral chemistry? Can you actually just not only use minerals themselves, but their chemistry and the variations in that chemistry to vector uh, towards ore? Obviously, then you have to have a very good comprehension of element migration and detection, also your your glacial stratigraphy. Um, in some cases, again, if you can if you if you take a good look at this, some of this. Uh, the, the superficial cover is actually pre-glacial and it hasn't moved. So if you can, if you can recognize that and understand that, then you, you can use these indicators in situ to give you an idea of where you are in the system. The other thing that's coming out now, because what happens is that if you have some kind of, if you have your uh, particularly sulfide rich systems at that interface between bedrock and, uh, and, uh, and the superficial cover, that you actually get a reduction uh, through various processes and that decomposition of that sulfide and it can form uh, uh, gases uh, and it can form other secondary uh, minerals, etc. within that and you actually get fluid migration, gas migration paths uh, within that superficial cover. And so we have uh, uh, this idea of coming, going outside of the mineral sector to look for new ideas. And one of them was looking at genomics, and this is becoming a very big thing in Canada. There's Genomics BC, Genomics Ontario, Genomics Canada. And so Peter Winterburn at uh, UBC, the Acme uh, Geochem Chair, uh, has, has got a particular interest in this idea. Can we barcode the bacteria within 
the superficial uh, cover in order to know that we have some underlying mineralization. When you're in the processing business and you have a closed system that you're using bacteria to leach, you, you, can, you can control those populations to some extent. But when you're in, a, in an open system like this, it, it becomes a challenge. It's, it's not only identifying the different species, but then having to barcode them, which is becoming cheaper and cheaper, by the way, to do. So the other thing is, and, and there's been some work on this hydrocarbon gas detection, basically the decomposition of your bacteria, and, and the gas uh, heads up to the surface. Um, the hydrocarbon industry, uh, for years now, have been using drones, and what they do is they detect gas leaks from their pipelines. And so these are continuous drones that run up and down the pipelines and looking for these leaks. So we can use that technology to actually start to do mineral exploration with it. And, and then again, we're looking at cheaper and more effective isotopic tracers. But again, all of this depends on a better understanding of element migration and detection uh, within this very, very complex environment, these surficial environments. Okay. So discovery uh, technology and protocols. Um, I mentioned that the, um, uh, the deep exploration technology, CRC, uh, is doing a fantastic job on, uh, on trying to get better information out of the drill hole. Uh, let's give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, Bear uh, came up with a number. They spent about $250 million on drilling. So if you can reduce those costs by 25%, you're making significant returns. So I think this is, this is the kind of program that's great. But I think what's more important, and we're seeing not only in, 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 in this happening in Australia, there's, there's companies like uh, DCI uh, in, in Canada that are uh, constantly uh, uh, improving their ability to do downhole rock properties, and of course we'll talk about rock properties in a little more in a minute, but I think what's important about this is this idea of generating real-time data, and it has two purposes, is it allows the geologists in the field to better direct uh, in real time their drilling project, so that you, you can drill fewer holes, uh, and you can do it in, in, with, with, in, a, in a less amount of time, but I think also what we've got to realize is that we have that satellite capability, and companies are doing this already. You can send it back to a central office where you have your geochemistry, geophysicist, and, and all of these people uh, sitting around at one table. And they can look at this data in real time, and, and perhaps they can catch something that the guy in the field isn't catching. And so, again, we've hugely increased our capacity, our decision-making capacity with respect to uh, how, how we drill, where we drill. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is going to be a very important advance that we're going to see uh, taken up by the industry within the next few years. Okay. Um, again, I've been through this. I, I keep pounding it through the whole talk with this idea that, that whose responsibility is it for these new technologies? It's the service providers. And again, this idea of survival innovation is built into that, into that market model and, and, and has to be supported by the mineral industry. I think just as importantly, though, is, is the industry has to train the academics community to understand that it's not their job to develop the technologies or anything, but you have to know what the processes are behind the results you get from these technologies. And that's still an extremely important role for, for the university networks. It's this idea of allowing the explorationists to we get all these numbers, but what do they mean? And, and I think you can't just use them blindly. Um, and as we, get a, 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 as we refine our, our ability to detect these systems further and further out for known mineralization, and we have to understand the processes that are controlling uh, these anomalies more and more so that we can vector more effectively towards the center of the system. And again, I think, one, and, and again, so these, we've got the service industry, we've got the universities, and again, this idea of, of developing collectives or consortia. Uh, to allow you to, to, to reduce the risk in, in supporting the development of new protocols and technology. Um, data to knowledge, again, very quickly, I said we're data rich, knowledge poor. Uh, more and more we're looking for uh, a system that can handle big data, uh, talking about cloud-based in here. Uh, data integration for visualization, again, big data interfaces of analytics, this can also be done on the cloud now. Something else we'll talk about, the better constrained 3D joint inversion, and, and what actually, how you should think about inversion. Um, and this idea of proxies to replace spare, uh, sparse data with richer data sets. So in other words, you can only spend so much money doing downhole rock property work, 
Uh, but how do you use those vast lithogeochemical data sets that you develop as a proxy to your rock properties to better, better uh, uh, constrain your models? So you get better protocols on the use of multi-instrument platforms. Again, this is something that the scenic uh, industry people uh, are, are seem to be focusing more and more on. It's not what instruments to use, it's how you use them more effectively and not singular, in, in a singular fashion. How are you using these, these multi-instrument platforms to get as much information as you can? <coughs> and then that carries right on to this other idea of to advanced exploration, you have to cement a better relationship with the rest of the life of mine continuum in order to, for your company to realize how effective you really are. Because we all know that as soon as you get a downturn, the first thing to go is exploration. But if you're making yourself, if, if, if your upper echelon understands what a critical component you are to the life of mind system, then they're going to be twice before they start dropping your budgets. So managing the data, again, I just mentioned these as examples because they have, they're seen as sponsors, but data, data management is, is a huge problem. And there's, there's uh, becoming industry standards now, a Geosoft Oasis. Uh, Reflex Hub, uh, Myra uh, Geosciences is developing the integrator uh, system. And what's important about these is that they're usually spatially aware data repositories that allows you to transfer your data into analytic packages that are GIS based and, and, and can operate in three dimensions or four dimensions if you so desire. Uh, and so they're becoming intelligent data management systems. And I think we're going to see some huge advances of that in the next few years. This idea of machine learning, uh, the idea of, of, of the, that the system can actually auto-correct itself with respect to how it handles the data, which is kind of scary in a way. But anyway, it, it, I think it's, you're going to see some incredible advances in, in, in these linkages between how you store your data and how you analyze the data until finally the interface will be complete. Uh, there won't be any difference. So this interoperability is something we already see between things like GoCat and IOGAS, which are two separate companies. And again, if the companies realize that you can't just, you can't be exclusive once you develop a product because you realize that's not how you're going to make money anymore. How you make money is by making your product interoperable with everybody else. And of course for us, that becomes even better because you're not stuck with one platform. You can move between platforms depending on, on, on what your, 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 your challenges are at that time. This idea of greater computer uh, pro, uh, power is something that the cloud will give us. You don't have to go to IBM's Big Blue uh, to, to do your analytics for, for big data sets. And what that allows us to do now, and I won't get into it now, is this idea of moving from deterministic to non-deterministic. So deterministic is when I say I have a deposit model and I'm going to interrogate my data within the framework of that model. Well, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. It's time we start perhaps letting the data tell us where these anomalies are. And so this idea is in order to do that, it usually takes, you have to have a lot of computing power to allow this thing crunch up from Skokat. Stochastic. Thank you. Stochastic space. So these are the kind of, these are the, the directions we're going in here. Now, I think very quickly about inversions is that inversions aren't a geophysical tool; they're a data integration tool. Um, and as soon as people get their mind around that, that they're not going to be stuck in this this space of we're going from one to two D to three D EM, which is now. Uh, the codes at UBC uh, are available for those to find you're getting in the joint uh, uh, mag gravity space, but you're still in that geophysics space and you still have poorly constrained data because you're not using these things that you collect all the time in your projects. Rock properties, geochemistry, and mineral chemistry. So the challenge, and, and again, Mike will talk about this a bit in Footprints, is that this is the challenge we gave. And, and in, our, in our project structure in Footprints, we moved inversion out of geophysics and put it in data integration to get people in that mindset that there's so much more you can do uh, with, with inversion modeling. And, and once we break these codes, then all of a sudden, uh, you're going to see deep and undercover targeting is going to become much more refined. Now, I'm talking about ore characterization in the context, two minutes. Of, two minutes, two minutes. In the, in the context of, of data to knowledge, because again, it's not the technology, it's, it's getting our minds around how to use that technology. And what's important here is that, that this idea of these, of these uh, um, multi-parameter packages that are often wrapped around uh, spectral analysis and, and core scan, the Australian company, Platonic Knowledge in Canada, there, there's other ones that are doing this. But it's the idea of the exploration, this understanding that 
this becomes the gateway to poor characterization. And if we if we can take ownership of ore characterization at the expiration stage instead of at the processing stage, then all of a sudden again, <coughs> expiration takes on a whole new meaning to your company. And, and they realize that you can, you can develop much more knowledge about the potential of that, of your ore deposit at the advanced expiration stage rather than waiting for the engineers to come in and do all the geotechnical work and stuff like this and taking the credit for it. So again, this is this idea of, of, of using these new technologies to better wed, to better meld expiration into the life of mine continuum. Whoops. Okay, and again, this is the whole idea of that, you know, geometallurgy, uh, we're talking assays, the same as talking grade control, which goes all the way into, into waste management, and so you become a more integral part uh, of your company's uh, flow sheet. And to take that into the scenic world, as I already showed you, the expiration roadmap. Well, that roadmap is just one part of something we call uh, Towards Zero Waste, which is our overall roadmap for the Canada Mining Innovation Council. That basically we're saying in 20 years, there will be no tailings, and our footprint will be zero. And I hear a lot of people say that's impossible. Nothing's impossible. It's a matter of finding the right technologies and finding the right innovators to, to drive that. So again, it's this idea of the technologies, all that has to fit into a roadmap. The roadmap always fits into your company's roadmap. And once you do that, then they understand the criticality of that first stage of the process. Um, I, I, I won't go through this stuff. This idea of technology transfer, if we're looking at, at, at developing mineral maps instead of identifying minerals, we go outside of our own industry into the pharmaceutical industry using Raman spectrometry as an example. So again, this idea that we have to start reaching outside of our industry to bring in existing technologies and modify it. It's a lot cheaper than reinventing the wheel. So very quickly then, avenues for incubating step change. It's this idea of understanding the knowledge gaps uh, and how they affect your company's exploration strategy uh, using uh, organizations such as Amira, Scenic, Camaro as, as leverage vehicles for RDI. Uh, to, to mitigate the risk of, of, of research, uh, inv investing in research in your companies. Something that Michael talked about is, is developing a better fusion between academic and in into industry intellectual capacity. Um, I think for the service providers, there's a challenge of moving out of the laboratory and into real time in the field. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of the analytical firms have not quite grasped yet because they've got a lot of money invested in those labs, but it, they have to stay ahead of the of the edge, and they got to realize they have to be in the field with you guys. Um, this idea of, uh, I'll go through this stuff here. I, I've already talked about most of this stuff, um, and I'm out of time. So what I'll do is, this talk is different than the one that's in your book. Uh, what I'll do is I'll have it, uh, I'll have it generated and sent out to you through the, through the mail list. Good. Okay. Thank you.